Salt is a mineral that forms over time from bits of other minerals that are eroded and collect in the oceans of the world. All animals, including humans, must ingest salt in order to survive. Modern mining practices have made salt a common commodity, but it was so hard to come by in the past that it was valued as highly as gold in many ancient cultures. Salt lying underground in Alabama has proven to be a valuable asset both in the past and the present. A very large salt deposit formed during the earliest stages of the opening of the Gulf of Mexico. As the sea began to move into the area, it would periodically evaporate, leaving a large salt deposit. The salt is found in southwest Alabama at a depth of generally three to five miles, and increasing in depth the farther south you go toward the Gulf of Mexico. In the woodlands of southwest Alabama, there are areas where salt is brought to the surface by rising water. No vegetation grows in the immediate area of these salt seeps, but the clearings are littered with animal footprints and broken fragments of Native American pottery, indicating the importance of the life-sustaining salt that can be found here. There's a large fault in uh, southwest Alabama called the Jackson Fault, and along this fault is where most of the documented salt seeps are. And this is not too far from the edge of the major salt sheet, but along this fault, the salt becomes very shallow, and the salt has risen up. The Jackson Fault is named for the town of Jackson in Clark County. To the west lies Washington County, and the site of Alabama's first capital, St. Stephen's, located on a bluff rising above the Tom Bigby River. In 1811, still part of the Mississippi Territory, St. Stephen's was incorporated as the town of St. Stephen's. Uh, continued to grow in 1817 when Mississippi became its own state. Uh, this became uh, Alabama uh, territory and St. Stephen's was Alabama's territorial capital. From 1817 to 1819, uh, right down the street a short ways, uh, the first territorial legislature convened under the direction of William White Bibb, our first governor. The state capital was moved from St. Stephen's in 1819 and the town was completely abandoned in the 1830s. Written accounts and archaeological research provide an image of what the town was like. They're said to be as many as 3,500 to possibly 5,000 people. Uh, there are a number of travelers who came through here. There were over 30 licensed taverns. Uh, and it's interesting, there was not a church building uh, in, in the town. They had, there was the Pebble Springs Jockey Club. They had horse races here. They had uh, attorneys. They had banks. They had um, opera. They had plays. They had all kind of things, all kind of cultured things here in, the, in these hills. It uh, went to a peak and then and went back down. But anyway, it would have all the finer things for the bigger cities back east at a time. Both Washington and Clark counties are sparsely populated with large expanses of woodland areas. Clark County, although not la the largest in population, is one of the largest in land mass. And we probably have more river frontage than any other county. We have the, uh, in, in, in Alabama, that is, uh, we have uh, the Tom Bigby River to the west, and the Alabama River is our border to the east. They flow together about 30 miles below Jackson and form the Mobile River. While it was still a territory, geologists were sent to determine where the mineral resources were in the state. And certain ones were uh, reserved for the state of Alabama. And they became a land that uh, the state of Alabama would keep in their possession. The salt lands that had been set aside for the state government were used by private individuals through the ensuing years. In those days, salt was more than seasoning. Salting foods was the only way to preserve them for any length of time. When the Civil War broke out, salt became scarce. The South had depended on supplies imported from Europe, but a blockade of southern ports meant that the salt of South Alabama had to be utilized. The Alabama state government formed a commission to oversee mining and distribution of the salt in southwest Alabama. Slaves were recruited to come work there, and they had agents who would go around the southern states asking 
that the uh, owners would allow their slaves to come work. They were paid $20 a month, and the, the owners were paid for the work of their slaves in salt because salt was so scarce that this was much more uh, valuable than any Confederate dollar would be. And all these records are in the state archives under the Salt Commission records. And it's just a, a remarkable story that really hasn't been told that widely. Some of the records are up through 1865 where they're trying to get all the bills paid. But they said as soon as the salt workers heard that the Union had taken over its Spanish fort and were marching up through Baldwin County, and they were about to cross the river, but the river was up, and so they haven't been able to get across, that they threw their pots down where they were and fled through the forest. The salt operations were clustered into three areas known as the upper, central, and lower salt works. Thousands of wells were dug in these areas to acquire salty water. On his farm near St. Stephen's, Ernest Goldman has found remnants of Civil War salt wells. Right back about oh, a mile, mile and a quarter, one small oak ridge back there sticking up out that river bottom area. There must be eight or ten of those wells. Some of them got piped just like those. They ran out of fuel back there to cook the salt out, and it was cheaper for them to pipe the water, the brown water up here, where they had a source of fuel to cook the salt out. They would pipe the salt water, brown water we call it, into the kettles and build a fire and it would heat about maybe seven or eight of them and uh, cook the salt water down until it crystallized and then take the salt out the crystals out and bag them up and go sell them. The wooden pipes were used to ob obtain the, the, the water from the lowest depth. The lower the water in the ground, the more saline it is, the saltier it is. Across the Tom Bigby, the upper works span for four miles along the Jackson Fault. This area was bustling with activity during the Civil War. There were approximately 4,000 people uh, working in the salt works, uh, most of these people were slaves, and um, uh, the the biggest majority of them were actually employed in cutting wood for the furnaces. And uh, these furnaces were operating 24 hours a day, round round the clock, and uh, so the act level of activity in that area must have been terrific with that many people w working and 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 everything on a day-to-day -day basis. Actually, what you would see there today would be quite a contrast from what it might have been uh, in 1863 to 1865 when the people were working there. Walter Davis took Jackie Matty and Michelle Ryan, editor of the South Alabamian newspaper, on a tour of a portion of the upper works. We'll just walk on down here and, and I'll show you where some of the old kills used to be. And you're not going to see too much because they've all deteriorated and fallen in over the years but you can see the depressions where they've drilled some wells or dug some wells, and then we can also see the outline of, of some of the uh, old furnaces. Uh, we'll see the mounds where the chimneys were, and we'll see where, the, where the, uh, the actual furnace was, where they put the pans on there to cook the salt water. You can see where they dug out around this end, and then they had two trenches down here that they lined with brick and limestone rock uh, to, to line the furnace with. The brick was made on site here at a, at a brick factory that they had, and they also had a sawmill here. And they would line these furnaces with the rock, put grates over the top, and put the big pans on the top and fill them with water, and, and when they built the fires under there and they cooked it down, and they, that's how they made the salt. We'll, we'll just stop right here. This mound of rocks is what's left of one of the old chimneys. Uh, at the, it was at the head end of the furnace. And originally this thing would have approx been approximately 50 feet tall. And now as you can see, it's, it's fallen down and it's only about four feet tall and it's all grown up with the vines and everything. It's kind of hard to tell what it was. But this would have been the, the upper end of the furnace and the other end 
would have been about 30 feet in that direction there. Okay, as you'll notice as we go on down here, this area is uh, covered with these palmetto plants. And these palmetto plants um, typically are associated with, with areas that where they knew that there would be salt water under the ground. And uh, so that was one of the features that they would look for when they were, they were trying to locate an area to, to dig wells. Where we are now is in the edge of the river swamp. If you'll remember where we came from back up here, it was mostly pine trees. And where the, the pine trees stop and we come into the edge of this swamp, from now on it'll be, it'll be hardwoods and the terrain will be completely different. And it's right along this transition area is where most of the salt wells are, are located. Now we'll just uh, head on down here into this clearing and we'll go down and actually look at some of the wells themselves and you can actually see some. This clearing that we're coming into, no vegetation grows out there because of the, the salt water. And uh, so we'll get out here and we'll look at those wells in just a minute. But I want to show you another thing right here. Um, right where we're standing here, from over there and through here, and it ran on back through the woods, they actually built a levee here in order to keep the, the water from getting up into the furnaces back up here in the hills because when the river water arises uh, after heavy rains, this whole swamp area is flooded. Okay, let's, let's just walk over here to this well and I'll show you how that uh, water came out of the ground that, that they used for making the salt. What you see there is, a, is the remains of a hollowed out cypress log. They used the, the logs instead of uh, pipes and they would set that in the ground and this water, in the, in the case of this well, is an artesian well. It didn't have to be pumped. And as that water would flow out, they would, they would capture it and take it up to the, to the uh, furnaces and cook it down and make the salt. And if you'll notice on the, the water that's on the ground here, it has a red coloration, and that's uh, from the sulfur content of the water. And the, the bubbles that you see coming up with the water are natural gas that's coming out of there, and you can actually throw a match on that and, and, and it will burn. But there are a series of these wells in this area. Uh, there's approximately four that are still flowing. And these wells have been going since, uh, well, at least 135 years. Most of the water that, that they used uh, out of those wells were, were, were caught in pans or, or some other device and then either transported to the, to the furnaces where they boiled it down, or in some cases they actually had I guess sluices where they actually flowed the water in, in troughs to the sites. And, uh, and I think there were also some steam pumps that they were able to actually pump some of the water uh, to the various locations. What they would do is they would take the water and put it in either large uh, flat pans or, or big iron kettles and then just simply uh, leave it on the fire until the, all the water had boiled away. And of course the, the residue that was left was, was the salt and uh, I've read some figures where they would say that, that seven gallons of water would yield uh, approximately one gallon of salt. And uh, in the upper salt works, they were producing uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 bushels of salt per day. Um, and that was using multiple furnaces. I'm not sure the exact number, but these things were rather large in size and uh, they produced a tremendous amount of salt. And uh, the salt, uh, in those days would bring anywhere from 10 to $40 per bushel. South of the town of Jackson is a cluster of Civil War era salt wells known as the Central Salt Works. The salt wells were located at the foot of a large hill known as Salt Mountain. This area here is right on the Jackson Fault. Uh, you can see right here beyond us is, is uh, Salt Mountain. You go on a little further and you see other outcroppings that indicate uh, the presence of a fault. And uh, here around this mountain, uh, these salt oozes come out. There were over a thousand salt wells operating in this area during the Civil War. But beaver dams on Salt Creek have raised the water level so that most of the wells are now covered. Nearby, limestone was quarried for construction during the war. We're in Clark County at the Central Salt Works. 
standing here in the quarry where the uh, limestone was taken out to build the furnaces. Right over here, we'll take a look at how the limestone was quarried. Graffiti has been carved into here since this block was cut out about 130 years ago. Before the block was cut, there had to be a trench dug all the way around this slab here so that the workmen would have room to get in deep enough to cut an eight or 10 inch block. And then the crosscut saw would have room to work in here and the men would have room to put their arms in to draw the saw back and forth. They just continue to saw back and forth until this slot is down as deep as they want it to be. Now the problem is to get the block down without it breaking all the pieces. And so they very carefully take a pry bar on this side and on that side, they put behind it and they score this down here a little bit and then that block falls forward on a soft bed of crushed limestone. And at that point, they cut it up into strips, probably eight inches uh, in height. And then they take those, those strips and they take them and saw them into individual blocks. When they started quarrying here, they started way up high here. That was ground level. As you can see, these slabs have been taken off up there. And then they started coming down and as they came down, they went deeper in. You see the slabs are deeper in. They come all the way down to the bottom and they got deeper and deeper. And then down here, they got really deep. But I'm sure that they tried to not get too deep because of the danger of it breaking off. And as you can see around here, they continued along here and got deeper and deeper in here. And eventually they were so deep back in here until finally this this overhang broke off. And right there, you can see this huge rock that broke off from up here. Under that rock is a wagon, two mules, a dog, and a man. The stone, the people just come there and get it and take it to their homes and build the foundation for the houses, blocks, and they build the chimneys out of these same block. And then they wouldn't have to come here and cut their own stone. And the old salt kettles, many of the old salt kettles, you can go to some of these old homes around in this area and find one of these old salt kettles sitting in the backyard. Further to the south, remnants of the lower salt works can be found on the Fred T. Stimson Game Sanctuary. What we're looking at, at here is uh, one of these salt wells where the water comes up out of the ground. These casings are drilled right down through the center with about a three inch diameter hole. The casing itself is about eight inches and uh, they're made out of local pines that came out of these forests around here, longleaf pine. Now in this particular area here, there are perhaps uh, 20 or 30 of these, of this sort of uh, a well that produce brine for the evaporators and the evaporators are located up here right on the hill. Although little evidence of the massive salt processing operation remains today, records maintained by the Alabama Salt Commission during the Civil War have become a valuable resource to researchers of African-American family histories. The mines had to be worked, and they were worked by African-Americans who were slaves, at the, enslaved people at the time. And in some cases, those, the records that were kept had uh, information on, you know, as the name, and in some cases it just says 53 Negroes, uh, 53 slaves, and but the owner, you know, of that particular, they had the owner's name, so that's a, sometimes that's a clue. You may get information from a tombstone, you may get information from a census, you may get information from a marriage record, and lo and behold, now we got information from the Salt Commission records. Jackie Maddie has done a, a database uh, where she has listed the um, the names of the owners, if there were names of the slaves, if not, she said like three bought Negroes or five Negroes, and she was listing what the payments were. And that can be sorted by name of the slave or by name of the owner and, uh, and, and county too.
the 1947 discovery of a huge salt deposit known as a salt dome under the town of McIntosh has led to the growth of a large industrial complex. Olin Chlor Alkali Products is at the heart of the industrial growth. When the salt dome was discovered, there was an initial study that was performed that uh, identified the upper formation of the dome or the salt formation to be roughly a mile in diameter and approximately 500 feet below the surface. Salt is much lighter than, than the other rock types around it, so it will tend to rise up. In a salt dome, which is really just a big pillar of salt that rises up through sediment as it accumulates, uh, it acts kind of like a lava lamp. Olin uses a process known as solution mining to bring salt from the dome to the surface. We actually bore a hole from the surface down through the clay and cap rock into the salt formation, into the salt dome, and the depth is roughly a thousand feet below the surface before we start to solution mine. And solution mining itself is actually injecting or pumping water down into the, into the tubing and the casing, down into the salt dome, and actually dissolving salt out of the formation. And we do it in such a way that we control the geometry of this cavity. And that cavity starts at roughly a thousand feet below the surface and goes down to approximately 4,000 feet. After it is pumped to the surface, the brine water is subjected to a chemical process known as electrolysis to break the salt into its components. The chemical components are then shipped by railway or delivered through pipes to other plants where they're used in manufacturing a variety of products. There are two key products that, uh, that come out of the process and it's uh, chlorine and caustic soda. There is a byproduct of hydrogen. Uh, chlorine is found, it's used in many applications, primarily in the vinyl industry. It's been used uh, historically in, uh, in brightening pulp, and uh, that's changed some over the years. It's used to make uh, paint products such as titanium dioxide. Uh, very heavily used in vinyl industry for sure. All the plastics, uh, the medical profession uses it extensively. Uh, you know, you go to the store, the bottles you buy, the plastic bottles, the dashboard in your car, the seats, the cushions, the foam. Those are all products based on chlorine chemistry. Caustic is used in applications such as making glass, uh, producing pulp for the newspapers you read, uh, used in uh, many, many processes, food processing, uh, and, uh, and also uh, in, the produ in producing clothing, mercenizing cotton. Those are some of the, the major applications of both chlorine and caustic. Hydrogen, hydrogen has chemical application as well as fuels. It's also used in uh, in the uh, space program is one of the fuel components in the, uh, in the launches of the uh, space shuttles. Solution mining leaves empty chambers deep under the ground. These chambers make excellent storage containers. Bay Gas stores natural gas in one of these empty caverns. Nearby, the Alabama Electric Cooperative stores compressed air that is used to generate electricity. We take energy from a base load plant, our Lowman plant primarily, up in Leroy, a coal-fired plant, when we're, they don't need to generate the energy. We take it, we compress air and store it in a cavern, and then during the daytime when the load picks up, we displace the high-priced energy from off-system with cheap energy that we generate here. When we tie on line at night, we use the uh, motor generator as a motor. We take 50 megawatts offline, and we turn three compressors and we take atmospheric air and we compress it up to 1,100 pounds and put it in the cavern. During the daytime when we want to generate electricity, we take it back out of the cavern. We fire it at 1,000 degrees in the high pressure expander and 1,600 degrees in the low pressure expander and we generate from 10 to 110 megawatts. We're the only one like this in the United States. The first one's in Huntorf, Germany. They're uh, 290 megawatts, four hours of storage. We're 110 megawatts, 26 hours of storage. The key to our plant is the salt cavern. The bottom of the cavern is 1,500 feet. It's about 230 feet in diameter, which gives us 19 million cubic feet. If we get a crack or a fissure in there, it, uh, it, it's self-healing. Uh, the walls are smooth, and uh, we don't pick up any salt coming back out into there. The salt of southwest Alabama has played an important role in the state's past. With a large supply yet to be tapped, this natural resource will be an important part of Alabama's story.
for years to come.